fantastic. So thank you for joining us uh, during this panel discussion. I'm very, very excited to be here uh, with this lovely group of panelists. I feel a little bit like the outsider since they know each other so well, and I'm <laughs> a little bit of a newcomer in the space. <laughs> uh, we are going to be talking about something that I find very innovative, which is how biology can serve as inspiration for innovation in materials. Uh, so, to tell you a little bit about myself, my name is Marcial Vargas. I work for a company called Qantas, and we support uh, companies, uh, mostly brand owners, in building their sustainability strategy, finding the best solutions to reduce their impact. And so we've started looking into these types of solutions, trying to see what is the potential that they have, what can they bring forth. And for me, it's super exciting. Uh, I've been working in sustainability for 10 years now, and it's always great when we find new solutions to old problems. I am very excited about the panel that we have today. So with me today on stage, we have Jen Keen, who is CEO and founder of Modern Synthesis, uh, who are right there, if I'm not mistaken. So if you want to know more about the work that they are doing, of course, Jen will share a lot with you today, but you can also go and chat with the team over there. We also have Tom Ellis, who is a professor at Imperial College on synthetic genome engineering. And if that sounds like a mouthful to you, it does to me as well, but he'll <laughs> explain it to you very well uh, and tell you more about what that means. And last but definitely not least, we have Carole Collet, uh, who is director of Maison Zero, but also a professor at uh, Central Saint Martins. So, Carol, you're bringing a very different perspective, more on the design side, and we're very happy to have you as well on the panel. So just to give you a little bit of context and a little bit more uh, on this topic, we know that fashion is a little bit at a crossroads. It is considered today one of the most polluting industries out there. Uh, when it comes to GAG emissions or carbon emissions, numbers vary a little bit, but it's always between 2 to up to 10% of the global uh, impact that we have on the world, uh, and that is quite significant. And we know that fashion brands have started embracing that change. We heard from LVMH earlier on the work that they're doing on biodiversity and regeneration. Uh, I think some other fashion players will be also talking later today about how regenerative agriculture can be implemented. So we're really seeing that change. But one of the critical aspects to it is that when it comes to both new business models that we won't be covering today, or new materials and how that can change, there has been very little uptake in reality of what that means. Uh, there's been a big focus in the last 20, 30 years on synthetics and polyesters and nylons and so on. Uh, but since new solutions are very scarce and we don't see them uh, actually being applied at scale, so hopefully we'll get a new perspective of how uh, bio design can help us achieve that. But before we start, I, I do think that one of the reasons uh, on why that is happening is that while there is awareness of the problem, it's not fully there. I think that uh, most brands have now their CSR teams who are very aware and people are uh, desiring to go into that space, but I don't necessarily believe that everyone in the company is as aware as they could be on the sustainability challenges that we have. And Kaole, I wanted to start with you because you have 30 years of experience in this field. Uh, you are pretty much a pioneer of what it means to do sustainable fashion or look into sustainable materials into fashion. And I want to understand what led you here. Why did you decide that that was the right approach uh, for fashion? Well, because I was really looking at how, uh, when I studied 30 years ago, more than that, I, I really became very much aware that being a creative, implied really impacting on, on our surroundings, on nature, on the natural world. And I didn't want to be, as a designer, someone that actually contributed to the depletion of our natural uh, systems. So I very early on started to think about how can we reconcile being a, a creative designer and an ecologist. And I was before the 92 Rio Summit, which was really helpful when it happened, because 30 years ago that conversation was uh, futile, not welcomed, uh, and not happening in, in many places. So um, I started looking at, okay, how can we actually start working in a way that's closer to the natural world? And how can we really even rethink 
uh, about a systems change. You know, our industry is based on an exploitation of natural world and petrochemicals. How else could we reinvent our textile industry? And for me, that was really looking at reconciling that notion of ecology and creativity. Uh, so I think that generally speaking, when we come, when we talk about sustainability, it's always very personal. And so Jen, Tom, I don't know if you also have some of those stories of what drove you down this path and why is sustainability in material so important to both of you. So maybe Jen, do you do Yeah, you start? sure. I mean, it's fun to be on this panel because actually I feel like all of our stories are very interlinked to this yeah. point. <laughs> um, and I come from a, a similar background from Carol um, as, a, as a designer and I studied fashion design. And I was always interested in textiles simply because textiles is a field that's really interlinked with human history actually. Um, if you think about like prehistoric times, how we would tell stories as humans and how we, it, it's intertwined with how we've evolved actually as a species. And that's what got me into it in the first place. Um, I quickly learned when I went into industry. So I worked for Adidas for many years in Germany, um, working on materials there. And this was oh, 10 years ago now. And it's relatively recent, but despite having been talks about sustainability and improving our industry for more decades than that, it really wasn't happening up until the last decade. And even when I was there, we were starting to start to communicate things around sustainability for the first time. And we quickly realized that big changes needed to happen in our supply chains, in the materials that we use, but the options just weren't there. And um, it's been incredible the last five years to see the jump um, from really sort of nascent ideas when I was at Central St. Martin's myself doing uh, material futures there to now actually companies like ours that are looking at how do we make these ideas real um, and the challenges, of course, that come along with that. <laughs> That's great. What about you, Tom? You, ha you have a little bit of a different profile than, yeah. than both Jen and Carol, but I'm That's sure right. you... Yeah, as a <laughs> bioengineer, uh, you know, my, my research is um, engineering DNA inside cells, get cells to optimize what they do, do new things, and that's a technology. And uh, it's something that's getting better and better as we sequence genomes and get new methods like CRISPR which allows us to go into s edit in cells the DNA and change it to a sequence, right? And I've been in this field about 20 years, and you know, 10 to 15 years ago, yeah, we were hearing sustainability. Wouldn't it be good if we can save the planet and things? But in my field, everyone was going, yes, okay, those are all all important things. But my research is going to do something for human health, or my research is going to do something biomedical right <laughs> and it's it's always and this continues and and what happens r richer people get to live longer <laughs> and occasionally we cure some uh problematic diseases or at least provide vaccines uh, but the world is still facing uh problems to do with particularly our energy use and our footprint on nature and what's been interesting i think in the last 15 years is watching you know as a professor we're both professors right one of the joyous things about being a professor is you continually having to be exposed to young people, <laughs> and those are the people you have to talk to. And the young people that come and talk to me, they don't care about, you know, uh, uh, well, a few of them do, but I'm not <laughs> going to say they don't care, but they care a lot less about a cure for Alzheimer's as they do about the planet, right? And so this is that, that narrative has changed a lot. And I would say maybe 10, 12 years ago, we were thinking, okay, well, maybe we can find ways to get cells to be better at doing things like making fuels for us as, as a, instead of pulling them out of the ground f as fossil fuels. But actually that crisis of energy for car transport and for heating our houses yeah. coming from the ground, you know, we can see on the horizon that there's an end to that in that electrical generation from solar and wind is, is getting better and better. Yeah. So, it, so now we're starting to think actually the sort of timescales it takes to get a technology like biotech to give a solution for something, we've got to look at the problems that are coming further down the line, right? And as, and as the, the impact, bad impact on the world sector shrinks for car transport and heating the house, then fashion materials, building houses and, and food become the real problems. And those are all problems of biology. So I think as a, someone who works with biology and thinks about how we can make it do stuff better for us, we have to get involved in this and we have to think about ways to, to work in this space and, 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 and help out. 
And I would add one thing to what you're saying, which is also the fact that as we decarbonize the energy industry, as cars become electric and so on, the reality is that a lot of the petrol that we use for materials is a co-product of what we use for energy. And so since we st if we stop producing oil for other uses, then the oil that we use for materials, the price will go up, even if it's yeah. still available. So we also need to be aware of that change and how that will impact other industries. Yeah, that's right. Definitely. And what I wanted to get to with, with this intro on, on your very interesting personal stories and the work that you're doing is that we see that, as you're saying, Tom, the, the industry is evolving. Fashion players are realizing that we need to find uh, new materials, proof being uh, all the people in this room. Um, and Jen, I think that you're in a position now being a CEO of a company where you have an eye out for everything that's happening out there. Would you mind sharing with us what is a little bit of your outlook on how the market is evolving? What are these new materials? What is exciting you? And oh, where man. do you think we will go down further down the line? There's so much in that story. Um, I, I can try in a nutshell to kind of explain at least my perspective on how things have evolved over the last few decades and why some of those shifts have happened and, and what we're seeing now and, and maybe some things that explain that and what we'll hopefully be seeing next. Um, so if you look back um, in history, we obviously had materials that were from nature, right? So from animals, so leather is a great example of that, is we had these skins, we learned how to process them, and that was what innovation was for hundreds of years, right? Um, the textile innovation revolution that actually started here in the UK, so it's interesting that we're all back here a little bit later, enabled us to make new materials and new textiles and put new performances into these materials. And then along came oil and our dependency on that. So as you mentioned, it was a byproduct of the petrol industry. So it was being able to make these materials that were byproducts, but also enabled new performance and enabled new lifestyles that we as humans desired. Um, in a sense, plastics and petrochemical based materials enabled the lifestyles that we're living today. Um, and for a long time, people, that was a good thing, right? Um, what we quickly realized over the last few decades is the harm of that. And so we've seen that shift away of how do we decouple our materials industry from petrochemicals. And so you started to see, and a lot of the folks that are in this room, some of the first players in this space, of bio-based uh, materials and trying to make the same materials, but from bio-based sources. And really a lot of that was the same polymers in the end, but taking new sources for that, which is a huge first step in being able to decouple from petrochemicals. The challenge with that is that, one, there's a cost differential off the bat, and so you need to be able to sell that in and you need people to understand why you're making that change. And so you started to see more um, storytelling around bio-based. So you've got sort of fruit-based or other plant-based materials coming up because this is something that really resonated with co consumers. You can understand that narrative if you don't understand materials that this came from a plant, it came from a fruit, and it now is a, a leather or at least the understanding of what a leather is to the average consumer. The challenge again, when you get there, is that they're not perfect solutions again. You still have to mix materials in a lot of cases. The sustainability credits aren't maybe quite 100% what we need, or the performance isn't. And this is where this whole generation of, of biofabricated materials really grew out of, was like, hey, okay, mimicking nature is one thing. How can we actually go back and relook at how nature makes materials and maybe make better ones this time around because we have the tools to look at how they've done. And I think the first really great example of that was uh, mycelium and a lot of the, the mushroom-based materials that you're actually seeing now in the flesh in reality that were just an idea five years ago. Um, and you're already starting to see these come to the market, but there's still challenges. And I think everyone in this space and in our space now, which is sort of the next generation of those biofabricated materials, um, is really looking at performance and how we can not only match the, the performance of materials today, but also educate a little bit that these are different materials um, and actually be able to embed new performances and new value to materials through this greater understanding of the natural materials. And so for us, that's really been the focus is how do we take, we work with um, bacterial nanocellulose, who I was introduced to by, by Tom and his lab many years ago, and we use nanocellulose to create these hybrid textiles um, that are super strong um, and actually really versatile. So cellulose is the strongest, it's the strongest form of cellulose, um, nanocellulose is, and we're able to make these um, 
composite materials that we can actually adapt to have different aesthetics, different forms, different functions, and really ad address a number of needs that are in the market, um, but without as much of the harmful effects. Thank you for that very extensive outlook. <laughs> I think it, it gives us a, a little bit of, of the whole history of materials in fashion. Carol, from your work as director of Maison Zero, you're also seeing a lot of those innovations coming through. You're assessing them, understanding them. What is your perspective? Why, I know that you are a big proponent of biodesign and, how, uh, and why you think that that is it's key. Can, can you tell us why that is? Well, the idea of biodesign is really that we need to look at how biology works in the natural environment. And biology works in cyclic systems using usually ambient temperature, local nutrients. Mm. Uh, the waste of one species becomes the nutrient for another set of species. Um, so it's, you know, how can we actually make the way that nature makes? That's the real question that underlines the foundation of mm. biodesign. And it, it's easy to say but it's really difficult to do. So what's exciting for me is that we are in that transition of trying to learn to fabricate like biology does. Um, and it's changing because we can see new startups like uh, Gen Startups. We have amazing research uh, that provides all the foundational, uh, fundamental scientific research. We have new educational model. We've set up a new Masters of Biodesign at Central St. Martins. We have a new Masters of Regenerative Design. We bring biologists and ecologists to teach the next generation of designers. We also have now, so we work with uh, LVMH, the luxury group. We're now developing this project to grow lab-grown keratin with Fendi. And so we now have young designers, you know, colleges like Central St. Martins, fully going ahead with biologists, ecologists, teaching designers. We have startups, we have scientific research groups connecting with the material fashion textile research. And we have industry like LVMH and Fendi uh, directly engaging with, you know, mastering these new bio materials. And I think for me, I know it's the title of our conversation, but the idea of innovation for me cannot be separate anymore from biology. That's where the answers are. But we are in that transition of learning how do we do that. And that's going to take time and we need to remain transparent around what works, what doesn't. Uh, what you're seeing at the back, so the Maison Zero, we're here to prototype. Our job is to prototype regenerative luxury. Uh, so this is a yeast making keratin. You're seeing a project we did last year, which was looking at uh, a, a bi an extended bio-based color palette where we mix algae, uh, bacteria, and food waste. And I think we need to really reinvent and reimagine what the future of design can be when you incorporate biology from day one in terms of its principles, system thinking, and in terms of its biological capacity. Mm -hmm. And that transition, what's exciting for me is that it's happening at all levels, you know, from education to startup to science labs and to industry and to, you know, hardcore uh, world leading companies that actually want to say, yeah, I want to know how can we make keratin in a lab. So I think for us, it's really important to really uh, acknowledge that it's happening at all levels now. We still need to accelerate. We have seven years to go for our climate targets, our biodiversity targets. We have the new 30 by 30 targets. But I think what's exciting for me is that it's finally happening. Where I'm less, um, where I'm more careful, I would say, is that we need to be careful that we don't start to use this bio word at every source to kind of, you know, it, to imply it's sustainable or regenerative because it, what's called bio doesn't mean it is, you know, there's no real legislation around that. So you could have a bio-based materials that have a part of petrochemicals and we need to be transparent about that. It may be we need that for now because we don't know yet fully how to do that green chemistry because we're in that transition. But I think we need to be very careful we don't assume that bio means ecological in the way we humans do that. In the way other species do it, yes, but in the way we humans do it, it's the same way as, you know, natural doesn't mean ecological because if you look at cotton agriculture, conventional cotton is a disaster for the planet. Organic regenerative cotton is brilliant. But you know, it is natural, but it's always thinking about natural or bio will only be ecological if it's built in as a core ethos in the development of these startups or the science research. 
And I think that's a very important message. I was actually having a very interesting discussion with one of the exhibitors today. Uh, they were very transparent about the assessments they had done, about uh, the life cycle assessment studies they had performed and so on. And that showed that their material is better than a lot of the, of the animal fibers out there, but it's not l zero impact or, not or very low impact, let's say. But they also acknowledge that there was an opportunity for them to improve further that impact. Mm. And, and that's the whole idea. How do we have that whole ethos in mind? And maybe it's a little bit late in the discussion, but I'm realizing that we, we haven't actually go in depth into what we're talking about in terms of what, how does it work? What are these materials? How do we come up and create them? Uh, and Tom, you're the expert here, and I want to pause there because I think your, your T-shirt summarizes very well what it's all about. Very science T-shirt. <laughs> so please do share with everyone why is this all about and why do you think this could be a great opportunity for reducing the impact of the fashion industry? Well, I mean, everyone here will know, obviously, that the vast majority of the materials used in the fashion industry are biological originally and are made by cells. And cells, like my T-shirt says, <laughs> make up us, make up all the bacteria, make up the, the trees and the crops that make the cotton. And our current process, if you sort of boil it down into getting those materials from a set of cells, is in some regards very inefficient, especially if you think about getting leather and having to uh, cut down rainforest, <laughs> cattle, all of the things associated with that before you finally get to leather. And then all of those chemical processes to tan and dye leather. And you can think of the same for any other material for, for um, you know, cottons and furs, things like this, right? There's all sorts of different things. So if you think about the cells, um, you know, there's ways now with, with our understanding of biology to think about going more to the source of the cells that make the materials? And are there ways that we can make get these materials from the cells without all of the other things associated with that? Um, effectively being more efficient. And yes, in some cases, that's going to require things like genetic engineering and growing things in labs and thinking about scaling that. But in other cases, maybe not. Um, ultimately, inside every cell is DNA. It's this coding language which we've sort of understood for about 70 years since the sequence was understood. And that's that's a very short period of time, right? I think I was looking at some history recently, and I think the first synthetic dyes for the textile industries are a good 100 years older than that. And I think they, someone at Imperial, where I'm from, <laughs> invented the first one. Uh, a student at the time who then didn't tell his professor and then spun out a company. <laughs> like a, it was the 1860s or something <laughs> like this, and then walked off with the first synthetic dye. Uh, sounds quite familiar. <laughs> um, and so this is a new technology, right? DNA is, is and cells and biotech, it's like, it's like we have found some sort of alien computer or iPhone and we're starting to work out how this technology works and how we can make use of it. And so I think fundamentally, whether we do it through genetic modification or not, we are getting better and better rapidly at understanding how these little machines called cells that make us all up make materials and could be made to make different materials and make them with less resources and make them with new features, uh, new feels, new ways, but fundamentally you know, make them with less impact uh, to the world. And from my point of view, you know, I want to be part of that story, but it's, it's done by research teams all over the world, companies as well. I think there's at least one other um, company over there that comes from, their product comes from a startup that's uh, from a synthetic biology research group that I know over in California. You know, we, we want to help be part of these solutions through the, these possibilities of reprogramming DNA or, or changing the way cells grow and their environment they grow in. And I, I think it's a very promising future overall. I think that there are a lot of options out there, but the reality is that we're still seeing very little acceleration, or at least I, I think that brands get frustrated because it doesn't move fast enough. And, and I wanted to go uh, dig a little bit deeper with all of you on why that is, because I think we focus sometimes in these types of events generally on the positive, which is great. We need to applaud ourselves. There has been progress, and that is important to acknowledge. But it's also an opportunity for all of us to reflect on what is not working so well and how can we work together to change it. So, Tom, maybe 
you can start and, and guide us through what are the challenges that you're seeing at your level? Well, so what we do is really far away <laughs> from a product, right? Because we're working in the lab on lab scale things, trying to make something that is no one's ever made before or with, with some feature. And we want to, at the earliest stages as, as possible, communicate and have discussions with potential downstream users. But that's a little bit difficult, right? So Carol and I work on this project to get yeast cells to make keratin. And potentially in the future, that could be made into a replacement for fur. And we talk to then people, ateliers, who work with these kind of um, materials, but not the biotech ones we're going to make. And they stare at us as like, well, when are we going to get a sample to work <laughs> with? How, how is this going to work? And this, th that, I think, is a big challenge in that a lot of these materials, the ones here are more in this room are more advanced than the ones we do we make in my group in terms of actually getting to something that you could make at a, at a scale. But even then, thinking about then having a conversation with someone who wants it at a really, really big scale, I think that that's a big problem. Um, and so recently in, in conversations about bacterial cellulose as a material, uh, someone called me up and, and said, oh, maybe we can do a project. We provide roughly about a third of the materials for car interiors for the world. <laughs> and I was like, well, okay, that's a big scale difference from a Petri dish. <laughs> uh, I don't know how I'm going <laughs> to help out here, but maybe I need to just think of the innovations that I can do now that then maybe can be scaled in decades and then solve this problem. Jen, you're a little bit further down the line, so you're already trying to get that to scale and, and to actually put it in practice. What are the challenges you are seeing? How, how do you feel about what Tom just shared and what is your perspective on what is slowing you down or actually not playing in your favor? I mean, as Tom kind of alluded to, there's one biological element that we often forget about, which is humans. <laughs> um, a lot of time, we're the problem. Um, and I mean, there's, there's a couple of big challenges um, that startups are facing in, in getting these materials out to the market. Um, and the first one is, is expectations around these materials. And this is, um, as he mentioned, like time scales. So traditionally, materials took decades to come to market. So that is the time scales that we traditionally used to working with. So most of the materials that you're wearing today have been in development for at least 30 years, maybe a couple hundred. Um, and so we're, as a field, really speeding up that innovation cycle, which is incredible. The technologies we can do today to speed up that cycle are just like unheard of. And it's really inspiring to see what's happened just in the last few years in this field. Um, but the expectations of brands who you work with materials, like when I worked at Adidas years ago, you have these quick turnarounds. You know, we would do a development cycle of somewhere between three and 18 months to get a new material into market. And these are small changes, right? These are like you change the color, you change the texture, you maybe put a print on it. But that's how fashion is used to working, these really quick changes. Um, the challenge when you're doing real fundamental material innovation is that the timescales are a little bit different. And also, you can't fit every material, it can't solve all of the problems. So this is something that we've really worked on, is how we can understand like what is the actual problem. I think a lot of times it's easy to compare, oh, I'm replacing leather, or I'm replacing cotton, or I'm doing this. And really, we need to step back and be like, well, what are those materials doing in the product? What is the product need? What is this particular customer need? Because that might not be the same for a luxury customer versus a high street customer. And so really understanding what those materials are doing and really tailoring and prioritizing the material development for that to actually get things out in the world and try them out and do this iteration cycle. So that's one side. The scaling side um, is the next challenge where a lot of folks are getting sort of stuck in that cycle. And this is more coming down to the way that industry works as a whole and the, and these, the systems of different um, players and how they interact. So typically, brands aren't used to actually putting in any skin in the game in the material development process because the established players are funding their own development because they have revenues that have been going for a long time. So they'll do that development, and sometimes they'll charge a small fee, but typically it's built into the price of selling it because they know the customer will buy it. For startups, it's a completely new material. So on one side, you need justification to do the scaling, and the brands need to be able to actually make commitments for startups to get funding to be able to do the scale up in the first place. But on the flip side, it's also, well, 
they want to see proof of, is it scalable? Is it going to work? And so it's really about meeting in the middle and really truly collaborating from the beginning and being honest with each other about what the expectations are and not over-promising or also not asking for too much. I, I think that that's very insightful because as you're saying, there is a change in paradigm in how the industry works overall or things overall that needs to happen for these materials to actually succeed. Uh, and it's probably linked to how the industry operates overall in terms of seasons. We need to have new products every six months or so, uh, at least. And so already that creates that pressure to have m new, faster, how can we get it? But we need to change that paradigm. Because if we go back to what Tom shared, how in the automobile industry there are players already thinking about switching a quarter of their materials, but they also have different uh, time spaces to think about what they are trying to do. So that is definitely a change that we need to see. And I'm guessing, Carol, that you're seeing that as well in terms of that paradigm shift. How can we make it happen? Uh, the last time we talked, you were saying that you often feel that that's part of your role to orchestrate those discussions. So where do you see those challenges stemming from? Well, I mean, to, to again, to echo what has been said, I think the fashion industry historically has not invested in radical material innovation. It's been a purchaser of existing materials. And the investment has been in developing a creative um, potential or creative use of these existing materials. So that's a radical shift to now get uh, fashion, fashion brands to invest in startups, invest in material innovation, or in the case of Fendi, investing in a fundamental hardcore research with LVMH to, to grow keratin in a lab. This is very new. And we need more of that, so that it's a radical investment early on, not just waiting for it to happen and then say, okay, I'll buy some of this. Because we need this acceleration. The, the, there's two other challenges for me. One of them is that now, and you know at Quantis, we have the data. Yes. We know where we are with climate, where we are with biodiversity. <coughs> So is the fashion system. Brands are now very much aware we have very, very hardcore targets to meet. And that data means they want to accelerate their shift, which is brilliant. But, you know, we need the investment in making sure that we can get these materials. If we need to accelerate, we need to accelerate the funding side of things. But for me, the main challenge is also that fashion is still orchestrated around these rhythms of um, you know um, seasons you know how many collections a year and it's in pursuit of newness and i think we need to be in pursuit of betterness and better not just for humans but for other species and i think if we start to look at even in terms of the media and journalist uh, kind of take on innovation and material innovation there's still this search for oh, what's new, what's new. I mean, I have so many journalists saying, oh, what's new, what are you doing that's new? And I keep saying, it's not what's new that matters, it's what's better in the context of our planetary emergency. That should be the focus. Um, because, th because it's better and it still needs to evolve, so we need to think of that. But the other challenge for me is that we often lack perspective because we're in that emergency now. But I think we need to look at, if we are talking about a systems change, which is actually what, what we're doing, it's never happening over you know, a week, a season, a year. And I think we need to look at, and it's, you know, a lot of brands are looking at these new biomaterial innovations because climate change is happening. Even if we meet our target, we're now understanding actually it will not be in time. We know that. So, Climate shift is going to have a radical impact on how we grow our cotton, our flax, um, our nettles. And when we can't grow so much anymore, we're going to have to ferment. And I think for me, that's the big shift we need to start to look at is um, how we can, to move to, towards a biological system, we also need to make in a more local fashion. Yeah. Right now, you grow, fab, you, know, you grow a material somewhere, you ship it somewhere else, it's made somewhere else, the consumer is somewhere else. And, but as humans, the majority of humans live in big cities now. And in 2050, about two-thirds of humans will live in big cities. So we need to start to biofabricate our materials close to where we use them. So the potential of this biomaterial innovation is that they can be grown in a way that's not codependent on climate. 
So it's also about resilience. And I think we need to look at that bigger picture, that we need to move into a place where we can continue growing through regenerative systems. It's much more resilient to climate, but not many agricultural um, materials are, are actually grown in these agricultural models. So unless that happens radically, a lot of you know conventional cotton crops will fail because they won't be able to be resilient to climate change. So I think there's all that bigger picture that we often forget, and we need to make sure we don't lose sight of what we are looking at. Biology is to change the system, to apply different principles, but to start to reinvent completely the supply chain, <coughs> so we actually can be more resilient. Because at 50 degrees, how do you grow flax? That's not working. So we're going to have to really look at different ways to actually provide and procure the right materials, which in turn can be biodegradable and become fit stock for something else. Yeah. So we need that circularity in place as well. I, I think that something that resonates with the, the idea of being having a holistic view, that's one of our key principles at Puentes, the things that we really believe in, that we need to have the full picture and think about the system and everything that goes with it. One thing that I wanted to listen to you talk about, uh, Carol, maybe just in one or two minutes, is the fact that we need to focus also not only on the materials, but even the entire processes afterwards. Like, how do we weave it? How do we dye it? And so I think that the work that Maison Zero and LVMH are presenting on the dyeing process, for example, and that we can improve that is also an example of that. So I don't know if you'd like to comment in a few words. Yes, we have uh, our designer in residence this year, uh, Charlotte Verse, has uh, worked on a bacterial machine which she developed for her material features graduation course last year and then she spent six months at Maison Zero to develop the potential of bacterial dyeing and it's showcased over there. She'll be speaking on Wednesday so you'll see her images on Wednesday. Uh, but we're looking at how we can push the potential to shift towards bacterial colouring uh, through creative-led research. Just to wrap things up on our end, uh, Tom, I'm going to pick your brains on, on, or not pick your brains, I know you know this. Uh, could you share with us, uh, because you shared it with me when we first talked, what is your vision for the future for your grandchildren on this <laughs> idea of yeah. a system that is fully s local and circular? Yeah, so one thing I, I guess it tries to make me think of the sort of projects we do uh, in terms of research, PhD student projects and things, now in the 2020s, and thinking, okay, what, what might come out of this given these huge timescales that Jen mentioned about materials coming online and, and and different ways we do things. So maybe let's say 2,300 <laughs> <laughs> grandchildren of mine. So something I'll never see, right? But if you, they, they might still live in the same sort of houses we live in in London, um, you know, the, uh, the apartment block or the flat, right? And if you go to a flat in the UK um, or a house, there's normally that little room where you go in and there's the tumble dryer and then the washing machine on top, right? So, so let's have the vision to get rid of that because washing clothes is, <laughs> is, is bad for the environment anyway and bioplastics. Why don't we have two similar sized machines, one that digests the clothes you've worn that week, mushes them down into uh, polymers, uh, biomass, something like that because they've been designed with this circularity in mind. And then the second machine then prints that and dyes that in some format dries it out, and then has some items for you to wear the following week, right? You could think about that sort of decentralization. And actually, I think technically, there's a lot of challenges to get to that, <laughs> but it's not, it's not completely crazy that we can do something that digests, ferments, and makes new biomaterials, and then there are 3D printing and other, other mechanisms that could then automatically then produce you something based on some design that has been downloaded from an app store or something along those lines, right? Um, that will be, hopefully, uh, everyone will be long gone by then, so I'm not putting anyone's <laughs> jobs out of business with this idea, uh, but that's the sort of futuristic thinking we might want to work towards in the future. And what I think is great is that it's fully local, fully circular, fully inspired by biology, and so that's actually what we're trying to achieve in any case. We still have a few minutes, so I'm willing to take maybe one question from the audience if everyone is really, really <laughs> interested in, in getting some <laughs> insights. Uh, I see the team bringing the microphone. I see someone over there. <laughs> see that. Hello. Hi. I was curious to ask, who is supposed to decide what we can or can't do with DNA? Or like what we should or we shouldn't do with DNA or genetics manipulations? So. 
the ethics of one? genetics? <laughs> yeah, good question. <laughs> that was for you. Yeah, yeah, I'll take that. <laughs> well, it, it depends on the country you're in and, and the legal restrictions <laughs> on that. So we can now in the UK, we can edit, but not insert new genes, but we can edit genes in plants and grow them. Uh, we can't, that can't be done in European Union, who is still uh, an area where they won't allow that. Um, in microbes, which is where we produce where the kind of work we do, um, as long as it's uh, a contained use system, like a factory, then you can make these things and you sterilize the product when it's done and therefore it, it is fine. It's just being made with this process. And actually, many things that you probably touch or buy in the supermarket, cheeses and stuff, are through those processes. You just don't know about it. Um, and who decides that? Um, well, it's, it's government, legal, DEFRA is the, I think there's a new name for that ministry. They even have a advisory board called the Advisory Board for Contained Use of Genetic Modified Organisms. I'm on that advisory board, <laughs> so I, I get to see the positive and negative arguments on, on all of these things. Uh, just sort of should name that conflict of interest. <laughs> um, does that answer the question? Well, it broadly as well, the public, right? Because if the public don't like things, they can campaign against them, but they can also just not go out and buy them. But I, pers I, I would be disappointed if people didn't want to take advantage of the amazing things that you can achieve in terms of circularity and reduced pollution by being able to more optimize what biology can do. Because we've been doing that for decades, thousands of years, in fact, just through traditional methods of breeding and breeding and making crops look nothing like what they naturally would be like. Um, and this is just a way to uh, optimize that process. So it just felt a little scary, I think. Like, <laughs> if it goes wrong, it goes really wrong. So that's why I was curious to, yes, to understand but I, like, I who's would say thinking that about there's it. Who, nothing, because there, there's not a single case, I think, of, of a genetically modified crop that has then been used that has then caused health problems or, or major environmental problems. And meanwhile, in the 20 to 30 years where there's been a moratorium on GM crops in the European Union, we are now seeing a massive amount of, of uh, problems in terms of the climate uh, over those 20 to 30 years. Um, climate emergency is happening. Yep. You should be worried about that. Yes. And we should be looking at all possible solutions to help against that. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, just to wrap things up on our end, I'm super excited about the discussion we had. I think that the promise of biodesign and bio bioengineering for the development of new materials, uh, taking into account, of course, the ethics of it, uh, but considering the fact that we're mostly talking in the case that we have today about a contained environment, it really has a lot of promise because, as you mentioned, Gaul, we're talking about materials that ideally will be produced low temperature, let's say, or roughly room temperature uh, that might be using waste or co-products of different industries instead of relying on actual land and actual uh, fresh water to be developed. So there is a lot of promise. And of course, uh, we need to make sure that, that we deliver on that promise and that we put everything into place to make sure that these bio solutions are better, as you're saying, because that's what we should be looking for. So thank you, everyone. And uh, I think Kaol has her stand for Maison uh, Zero over there. Uh, you can talk with the teams for modern synthesis here. Uh, Tom, I don't know if you'll be hanging around, but maybe yeah. you can ask, answer some questions as well if people need to. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. <laughs>